next on Charles Grodin. Martin Short, known to some as Martin Shortman, and legendary musical master singer Art Garfunkel are my first guests on my first show, which may be my last show. That's next on Charles Grodin. Out of the tree of life, I just picked me a plum. You came along, and everything started into hum. Still, it's a real good bet. The best is yet to come. How much time do I have? You're on. I'm on? You're on now. Oh, for God's sakes. I'm sorry. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, uh, wait, good. Um, I'm sorry. Forgive me one second here. Uh, Geraldo wanted me to open with an anecdote about OJ. OJ wanted me to open with an anecdote about OJ. You know OJ? I know. Bob Berkowitz wanted me to, uh, to, to, to give an, an intimate detail about my sex life. <laughs> Phil wanted to borrow money. <laughs> I mean, he makes a fortune, but, uh, you know, he's got such a huge overhead. It's just, <laughs> I don't want this. I, I would like to, I'm sorry, forgive me. It's, uh, I'll get a, an earlier bus. <laughs> uh, I'd like to begin, really, with the, uh, with the behind-the-scenes uh, story of uh, how I come to be sitting here in uh, Tom Snyder's old seat. Um, uh, I have been wanting for a couple of years now to uh, stay home and spend time with my family, and I had uh, been trying to get a talk show going. I was actually with King World, the big syndicator for uh, Oprah Winfrey and Wheel of Fortune and Jeopardy, and we were developing a late-night uh, comedy variety show. Uh, you know, to to uh, to go opposite, uh, you know, the Tonight Show Letterman. And we and it was good. We were, uh, we, you know, I was uh, running up and down Broadway, you know, in a chicken suit, and uh, <laughs> we had the, you know, the frisbee, and I was jumping in mud. We had a horse that could type. I mean, really good stuff. But anyway, we did it. We did a run through, and David Letterman, who some of you may be surprised uh, to hear, is actually a good friend of mine, came and watched the run through, and. Uh, and he said, very funny, very funny. He was very complimentary. And then he put his arm around me and he walked me uh, down the hall and he said, uh, I would like to, uh, to see this go away. <laughs> and I said, what, how, do, how do you mean? He says, well, what, what do you, uh, this is King World, right? I said, yeah. He says, they're big. I said, yeah. I said, you'd be coming on when? I said, late night. <laughs> He's like, opposite, opposite me. I said, yeah, well, yeah. He says, you know what? I'd like it to go away. <laughs> I said, "Well, I don't know. What do you want? I don't know what you're saying. What are you offering me? Money? What are you saying?" He said, "Because I'm not comfortable with money." He said, "Whatever you want. What do you want?" I said, "Well, uh, first of all, I don't think you have anything to worry about. But uh, to tell you the truth, you know, running up and down Broadway and doing all the stuff you do and Jay Leno does really isn't what I want to do. I, there is something I would love to do, but uh, the job is taken, and Tom Snyder has it. Uh, <laughs> uh, it's CNBC." It's 10 o'clock, you come in at 10. Tonight I'm, you know, I'm even a little late, you know, but you come in at 10, you leave at 11, it's an hour. And, um, 
you know, you talk to the audience, you talk to the guests, you take some phone calls, you go home. It's one hour in the movies, it's 14 hours. What you do, you're in at nine, you're out, to, you know, and then you look at the thing and the bits and the thing. I would rather, you know, Tom Snyder, but uh, he says, you know, what if I can uh, open up that slot for you? <laughs> <laughs> and I said, well, how, you know, how, I don't, how, why, would, why would that be? I mean, this is like, it's the best job in television. Why? He says, well, you know. I've got control over the program after me, and uh, I think if I went to Tom Schneider and I said, uh, you know, how about coming over to CBS? I said, well, what, you know, that's 20 to 1. He's not going to leave 10 o'clock for 20 to I mean, who's up at 20 to 1? I mean, you were there. You didn't want to be there. He said, you know, I think I can sell Tom. I think I can, uh, I can give him the Tiffany Network and Mr. Paley and, uh, you know, Edward R. Murrow, Cronkite, the whole thing. Anyway, uh, David goes to Tom. He sells them on the whole thing. He opens up the slot. I get in here the second I hear this slot is open. We like, you know, you've made a lot of, you know, a lot of phone calls. And then I get in here. The problem was that after all this happened, uh, Tom realized that he had made a big mistake. <laughs> because this really is, I think, the best job in television. And uh, Tom really had some second thoughts. Jay, you, you want to you run the, the uh, clip of Tom? Okay. You were just telling me in the break that you I, are the I, stupidest guy in show business. Yeah, I'm leaving four nights a week, the greatest job I've ever had in my life, to go work five nights. But it was, uh, it was too late. And, uh, and of course, uh, you know, David Letterman will probably uh, deny this whole thing because it doesn't make him uh, look good to have manipulated all this thing. He doesn't really even care who comes on after him, frankly. You know, and uh, I'm sure he will deny it, but uh, for the members of the media who are watching, I can tell you that uh, David did this once before when Doug Henning, the magician, was developing a late night show also in syndication, I think with Group W, and uh, David actually bought Doug Henning. Oh, Doug, you never see Doug Henning that much. Doug is down in the Caribbean right now, you know, on a boat most of the time. Uh, so here I am, and I'm real glad to be here in, uh, in Tom's old seat. This literally is uh, Tom's old seat. Uh, Tom tried to take it with him, but NBC, uh, nothing gets out of this building. Uh, uh, now, now that I have the job, I do have one, uh, one problem as, as a host. Um, as I see it, my major problem is, uh, you know, a lot of people hate me. Uh, you know, there was, a, there was a lot of great support uh, from the press and the media. I really appreciate it. But there were some, uh, some very uh, true uh, headlines. Uh, Jay, can you show those, uh, those headlines? <laughs> you know, uh, now, now the reason that happened is I had done uh, a lot of uh, appearances over the years, uh, and, and in these appearances with Johnny Carson, David Letterman, and many other different people, uh, I had done these bits where I acted like I was angry, where I would attack people, and the problem was, you know, a lot of people actually believe that these bits were were real so this this got a lot of people saying i'm uncomfortable with them i find them you know unpleasant and uh and this is what started run, run, run the clips of these these are bits these are just bits run the clips of those bits if you would jay i think you're too old to do this show i have to be honest with you you know and i don't mean that as age prayer i think you're too old first of all are you comfortable standing up that long <laughs> I mean, all you're doing, you're kind of standing there reading off a card. It doesn't make any sense what you're doing. You've got everything backwards, you know. When you do your Sunday morning show, you're sitting, right? Right. They're fine. You like When those. you're standing, I don't think you could stand and ask intelligent questions at the same time. Just a professional opinion of another professional. Let me ask you. See, now that, that really was a joke. You know, uh, you know it just, I, I, I believe it was a total coincidence that, that shortly after that appearance, uh, John McLaughlin was canceled on uh, CNBC. Uh, but, but none of that is me. I want to tell you, now that I'm here, not in a guest capacity, but that I can actually be here and have a little more time to, uh, to uh, explain myself, that that is not the real me. Uh, the real me is something in, entirely different, and, uh, and that's what I'm going to hopefully reveal to you and there won't be any of that kind of stuff so those of you that you know that hate me uh, bear with me a little bit and uh, and we're going to be back uh, in a minute with uh, the first guest for, for for my first show the legendary uh miss Catherine hepburn <laughs> listen listen i'm gonna need i'm gonna need a little more laugh from the people can i wait, let, just run this with me for a minute i, I just need because we're mic there. Let me hear, like, say I said something really, uh, like, funny. Let me hear, let me hear some laughs. Let me hear. 
no, 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 more. I mean, like say, like, hilarious. No, like to say, I just like just said the funniest thing you ever heard. Let me hear that. That's it. That's it. Okay, that's good. That's good. Okay, that's good. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Sussman is my father, and he lives in Miami Beach. <laughs> it's Neil. Please sit. <laughs> now, my wife and I come here all the time, and I will tell you that the gaucho steak is wonderful. Now, your, your hair is like that for, how do you say the character, Franke? Frank? No, this is for Frank, the wedding coordinator of, uh, we're doing a father of the broad teeth. Right. Now, Frank is... Hello! A, a, as I understand it, uh, Franck is actually based on a, a real character who had a talk show in a country in Europe. Is that not true? Yes, that's true. And uh, he got, and interesting enough, you know, uh, giving some advice to you, he said a very interesting thing about talk shows when he was interviewed when I was doing my research. And what he said was, you must make sure that they listen to bar people, and the people will listen by me. So I think that's wise. I think that there's, that there's something to be learned there. He, what country did he have a talk show? Um, it was Eastern uh, Prussia. They have talk shows there. Not really. Uh huh. And what was it? What did he say? I'm sorry. It's my. What it is he... important to listen to be the people, and the people will listen to you, and then 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 I'm seduced another thing. That's that's what I'm going for. A lot of a lot of times, uh, a, a lot a lot of the people that you do, you've actually met. I, lo I love the story when you actually met Bette Davis on the uh, Tonight Show. <laughs> Tell me about that. Oh, uh, it was, it was, uh, well, you know, she was, she was, I had actually never done Betty Davis, but, but, um, they, they, I was the second guest out, and I thought it would be kind of, you know, hip, you know, as I want to be, to, to do Betty Davis for Betty Davis. So she was out, and she was very funny, very kind of, uh, intriguing, and I came out with Johnny Carson, I came out, and I shook Johnny's hand, and I said, and what a pleasure to meet you. <laughs> and she said, thank you. And of course, she had no idea who I, I was. She thought that's the way I spoke. And uh, so then I, you know, I did the interview with Johnny, and I'm doing different impersonations. And, 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 and it was interesting, because on the two shot with Johnny, you'd see smoke puffing in like the hair. <laughs> uh, but at one point, in the middle, of, I was doing an impersonation or something, and, and I hear this voice uh, you know, beside me. Do you do me? <laughs> uh, well, meanwhile, I'd done her. And I said, uh, well, you're not that easy to do. And she said, then skip it. <laughs> you know, I read this book that her daughter wrote about her, and it was interesting because it, what, what was struck me about it, she could be sitting at the dinner table, according to her daughter, and this wasn't Mommy Dearest, that was a Joan Crawford, but there was another book, Beloved yeah. Something. Anyway, sitting around the table, she would just turn on a cousin or an aunt or a sister-in-law and say something, don't think you're going to get away with it. <laughs> and the woman, like, what? Get away with what? You know, and she would do this on a regular, but everybody would be tense because everybody basically thinks they've done something wrong and hopes that no one calls them on. And, she, and I think she was an adrenaline freak. Well, it, 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 was, uh, it was odd. I, you know, the commercial break, I want, this is my first time on The Tonight Show, and in the commercial break, I, I, you know, they were, the band was playing, and... And I suddenly I looked, there was Johnny Carson, and there was Betty Davis. Oh, and Ed. But, you know, I mean, I was between these, between these two legends, and it was unbelievable. I didn't know what to say to her, so I, I leaned over there. A friend of mine lived in her building, and I said, uh, oh, such, such and such lives in uh, your building. She's a friend of mine. Isn't that intriguing? <laughs> <laughs> so I just, you know. I decided to let uh, Betty go. just stay with her thoughts. And then, and then uh, I love the story that you, you told me once about meeting uh, Bob Hope. Oh, that was sad. That was, it was, it was back... It was sad for you. Oh, it was sad. It's always sad. You know, you meet these legends and you really want to um, go away and be able to say that you were cool or that you, I mean, in an ideal world, you somehow impressed them or made them feel you were wise. But it never works out that way because you're nervous and you say dumb things. And I was... It was backstage, it was a, a benefit. Uh, Rosemary Clooney was doing this benefit at the Dorothy Chandler Pavilion, and Bob Hope was on it, and I'm uh, standing in the wings watching uh, uh, someone perform, and uh, suddenly I feel this kind of nudge beside me, and it's Bob Hope, it's 1989. Well, I think, you know, this is a major legend, and I, I, I don't know what to say to him, and, and finally I think at one point I won't say anything, and then I say, oh no, I will. I, 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 um, and I turned to him and said, hi, Mr. Hope, I'm Martin Short. And it's just such a pleasure uh, to meet you. And, and 
and he knew me. He knew who I was. He said, oh, yeah, you were in that, you were in that picture with Nolte. That was wild. <laughs> with Nolte. And I, yeah, Nick Nolte. That was wild. And I was so excited uh, that he knew me, and I thought, well, this is perfect. And then Melissa Manchester was standing in front of us, and then she turned after the singer on stage stopped, and the three of us are talking, and as kind of a joke, but to express true exhilaration, I turned to her and said, it's Bob Hope, and I gave him a low hug. Um, hugged him around the waist, like um, kind of like Sammy Davis did with Nixon, that picture. I don't know why, and he, Bob Hope stiffened, uh, because I think the rule of thumb, which I've learned from this story, is that you do not hug a 90-year-old 90 90 legend low. It's just, it's just not You like, don't hug him low. Yeah, you know, um, that, and you know, you use, you don't do the butter with your, your knife, you use a butter knife. There's certain things you learn. Anyway, he turned to Melissa Manchester and said, after I hugged him low, and he kind of said, <laughs> Hey, Melissa, I gotta talk to you. And they walked away. <laughs> <laughs> well, I told yeah. you, as we were talking over the weekend, I told you I was at a party recently and I was alone with Mike Nichols. And uh, he looked at me, first we were with Barbara Walters and everything was okay. Barbara walked away and I said, you know, let me know if you're going to be honored, you know, which didn't get any response at all from her. Because, <laughs> you know, I've been to a few honored. places where she's, where she's honored. And uh, yeah. then I was left alone with Mike and uh, he said, God, you know, we got to go. Well, we got to go see how Lee Grant's doing. She seems like she's not that comfortable. There are like 50 people. Lee was with her husband and four. I mean, he didn't want to be alone with me. I don't know why. He probably won't come on the show. But, uh, but anyway, I think no, we're coming. I once, yeah. No, you no, I was going to say that. I once, I, met, I once met Richard Burton. This was the one time I actually got it almost right. And it was backstage at Camelot. It was 1980. And in Toronto. Wait a minute, wait a minute. I'm going to hold this because I know we're going to come up to a hard commercial, which means we have to go out in 30 a seconds. A hard commercial? Yeah, the soft ones you can keep talking. Oh, so, so we have, what, about 15, 20 seconds? And I want to come back to something you said earlier about the butter knife, which was the only thing you said that I didn't... We have 15 seconds. What did you mean by that? With Bob, with a 90-year-old man, you don't use a knife, a butter knife. I'm, uh, it was an analogy. Oh, an analogy. An oh, analogy. I'm sorry. I'm you know, sorry. You don't, use, you don't butter your, uh, your, your bread with the knife that you're cutting the steak I didn't want with. to do analogies on opening night. <laughs> I'm sorry. But thanks anyway. Okay, we'll be right, we'll be right back. <laughs> Can you just act like a human boy for one minute here? Look at me like a person. You can't do it for more than a few seconds. Look at me like a human boy. Don't mess around with me. You're going to be back on that plane. I, I, uh, I got a kick earlier when we were talking about how you said there was a period of time when, when Johnny Carson was, was out there that uh, everybody that you would, the younger comics or the people that they would take on the persona of uh, Johnny and then, uh, and then David uh, more recently. Let's talk yeah. about that. Well, there's a whole, you know, I mean, I used to have a secretary. I, I, I had this uh, development deal at Disney. And, uh, and, and this guy was clearly, you know, a 30-year-old guy who had grown up in a frat house at university, and they watched Letterman, as those guys do, every night. So you hear them speaking, aha, in a tone that is exactly like, it's not quite Letterman, it's, you know, uh, you know I, 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 here's a message, I wrote it with a pen, and a pen, you love it, you need it, you can't write without it. And, and, and suddenly you hear guys, I, I know more guys now in a certain age group who say, uh, Marty, uh, leaving a message, uh, and this is what's going to happen to you. You know, I mean, it was like kind of when you'd see Burt Reynolds in 1973 go, okay. I mean, they were all doing Johnny, you know, everyone tried to sound like Johnny Carson. And now, I believe, with the success of this show, which is going to be a massive hit, that you're going to have a lot of people say, uh, you know, what I don't get about Mike Nichols is, I mean, I know Mike Nichols, and, uh, and for him to... To, 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 to not, I mean, Lee Grant was fine. I mean, what was wrong with Lee Grant? Her husband was there. There were 50 people at the party. And Bart Walters didn't get it. You know, it's, it's going to be a wave. Uh, we, we, you know, Jay Leno, I mean, as you know, as you've done the Tonight Show, Jay Leno really amazes me. Uh, he's, he goes out, he does his own warm-ups. Yeah. Uh, he, he, he does it. It's why I tell, talk to me. We can't, we can't do it yet. We're, we're going to get a, we're going to get a call from Jay Leno here. So let's just, uh, but I want to talk about Jay Leno anyway, because he's not, <laughs> not, what, he's not ready to call? We got, we, we got disconnected from Jay Leno. But Jay Leno, who is the only person. That's a good omen. Who has the time, really, to, uh, 
Jay does his own warm-ups, as you know, yes. having done the Tonight Show. Uh -huh. And Jay uh, does the Tonight Show, I think, five days a week. I think he does it five days a week. Yes. And then when Jay has a day off, he, he, he travels and appears elsewhere. Yeah. And now Jay has, let's see, what time is it? In, uh, so Jay just must have finished The Tonight Show tonight. He just yeah. finished the taping of The Tonight Show. And, and of course, so now he knows there's another show on. <laughs> so here he is, and I appreciate it. I love him. Jay Leno from California. How you Hello, doing? Hello, Charles. <laughs> How you doing, Jay? Jay, I have to tell you, we, we, we got the Democrat. We're getting research back already. And they say we're scoring very high with the uh, 21 to 23 group. Oh, if we can get a little, you know, pick up a little below that, a little older than that, we, we could be a threat, just to, it, just to let you know. It's that 22 and a half you're looking for. Yeah, yeah, yeah we're, we're, we're doing very strongly in that 21 to 23 where they say you're showing a little weakness. I'm sitting here with the Nielsen minute by minutes. Let me check. Uh, <laughs> oh, boy. Oh, you're boy. Sad. You see, the Marty Short, they, they're pulling them in. Yeah, yeah. The, went way up with Marty. And then there were some problems. But it looks good. You're tracking well. Yeah, but I think I think that the analogy thing. You're I think we went well. down with the uh, with the I mean, audience I'm, I'm under under NBC 21. Executive. That's where we lost. Wait, them. I'm here with some NBC exec. What is the? Yeah, there'll be a show tomorrow. They're gonna go again. With <laughs> they're gonna go to. They're going to. At, they're gonna go till Thursday, Friday, and then we'll see. Yeah, well, that's, 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 all you, that's all you have a right to ask for. Who do you have on uh, later tonight, Jay? Oh, we've got the Beatles. Brandon is doing a walk-on. So uh, what is it, Jay? You drink happen. after the show? Yourself? Is that, uh, is that, uh -huh. this is like a totally different Jay Leno. This is who you want to see, the Beatles. Jay, I'm going to be on the show, I think, next, uh, next Monday. You're on next Monday? Next Monday. And the last time I was on, I just want to uh, tell you, and I'm sure oh, I'm speaking Jerry for... Did Jerry Mathers fall out? Marty, uh, Jay, okay. let me... <laughs> Apparently, Jerry say? Mathers has fallen out, and you're on for next Monday. Yeah, well, they told me that. They were open about that. That was a, that, I don't mind that. That's right. okay, but I am on. And the last time I was on, you threw kibble at me, and uh, you brought out, all, you know, four St. Bernards, and uh, and when Marty got, gets up to do an impression and saying, you get up to do an impression and saying, and we appreciate that, Jay. We, oh, well, there you go. <laughs> but listen, well, thank anyway, you. Charles, you look good. We're sitting here watching. I just wanted to say congratulations. Thank you, Jay. Appreciate the call, and I'm sure Marty does as well. The Jay private... is gone. <laughs> Tell Marty I'll send him another telegram. Bye-bye. Bye. Thanks, Jay. Thanks, pal. <laughs> Anyway, that was, uh, that was actually Jay Leno. Uh, you know, later on, in about, uh, in about two minutes, we're going to bring out uh, Art Garfunkel. Uh, oh, I love Art Garfunkel. <laughs> and um, <laughs> you haven't made, like, your, your career on sincerity, have you? It's basically been characters. No, yeah, it's been characters and, and, uh, and, uh, and, and also use a switching of agencies every, every six months. So th th is that what you advise a young mm -hmm. actor to, to switch? Yeah, I'm with uh, Paul's Talent Group and Grill, which is working with mobs. So in other words, you work there as a waiter if you're not uh, working as an actor. Yeah, and it's, it's, it makes more sense. Well, you, the well, actors you, don't work much. You know, I, w once I bring out uh, Artie, of course I want you to you know, interrupt as much as possible, but, but I, I, I do want to say, you know, that uh, how happy I am that you were the uh, first guest on the first show and that uh, it's interesting to me to show all the, uh, you know, the different characters that you did and everything and how people like you uh, really aren't perceived the same way as someone, say, like a, like a Robert De Niro, like the great dramatic uh, actors, but the, the Marty Shorts of the world, specifically, I mean, Marty Short, <laughs> is a great, great, great actor and because he does comedic characters possibly people don't recognize that as much but you know comedic characters aren't easier they're harder that's why there was only one Peter Sellers and that's why there's only one Marty Short and I want to thank uh, Marty again so much and he's gonna stay here and be with Art Garfunkel and me and thank you very much for coming on this first night. Thank you Charles. <laughs> we'll right I'm back. blushing but there's so much pancake too on you can't see. <laughs> Okay, we're out. If you wish to purchase a copy of this program, please send 1995 plus 350 shipping and handling for a videotape, along with name, air date, and subject of the program to Pharrell's, PO Box 7, Livingston, New Jersey, 07039. For credit card orders, please call 1-800-777-8398. Washington. Go beyond the headlines to the reasons why. Equal time with Mary Matalin and exciting guests. It's never politics as usual on Equal Time.
Limousine service provided by Music Express, voted number one by the National Limousine Association, with offices in Los Angeles and in the New York area. Call Music Express to handle your corporate limo needs anywhere in the U.S. and the world. We're going to have a live singer in the studio every night, and, and frankly, for this first night, I, I could have pretty much had any singer I wanted. Maybe, maybe not Streisand or Whitney Houston. <laughs> Maybe Whitney, uh, <laughs> but I only asked Art Garfunkel. He's been my my close friend for 25 years and since Catch 22. Since Catch 22, and I am the godfather to his son James. Well, I'm not I'm not actually uh, his godfather. Does James have a godfather? Uh, no, James doesn't have a he godfather. Have, so it's it's an open position, so open. and we'll just see how we'll see how this show how goes. this goes. <laughs> anyway, with uh, with Paul Simon, he won eight Grammy awards. That, that's art, not James. And, uh, and he recorded such classic tunes as The Sounds of Silence and Bridge Over Troubled Water. And after their breakup in 1970, 24 years, 25 years ago, <coughs> the period we've been friends, that's strange. <coughs> uh, art has recorded nine solo albums, starred in such films as Catch-22 and Carnal Knowledge, and has written a book of poetry, Still Water. For the last 10 years, he has been slowly walking across America, picking up bottles for their deposit value. <laughs> now, I understand that there was an income dip after the Simon and Garfunkel break, but I, I did think that there was a lot of money in poetry. <laughs> Let me, now, you have been really walking across, uh, across the For country. about 10 years, that's right. And uh, why is that? I don't know why. I, I fell into it. I, uh, I went to Japan years ago for the first time in my life alone, and as I got to Japan, I conceived of the notion of walking across the country as a way to get to know Japan. And so I checked whatever luggage I had in this hotel in Kobe and walked across the country, and it worked. So then I thought I'll do it across America. It was 1986 or so, and I left my New York apartment and went across to George Washington and just carried on. And I've now done about... Uh, 30 different installments, so I'm up to the Idaho-Washington border. When you say it worked, what, what do you mean? Well, it's feasible. One can find a place to stay at night, and people don't attack you, and you don't get recognized as a celebrity, and, uh, and it's wonderfully freeing, and it's great for the heart, and it's great for the health. You're, you're a walker, aren't you, Miss Hepburn? I, I, I have walked, um, but not dreadfully across America. I find that insane. Did he say I don't know, uh, why would you do it? What would be your motivation? <laughs> You're such a lovely looking boy. Why do it? Well, now you I rode... I don't get it. You rode your bicycle to the studio, yes? I rode my bicycle, uh, to, but it's a tricycle, really. <laughs> Well, it's now, why, why did you do it? For the exercise, yes? No, I, I couldn't. No, I, I, I don't have um, a driver. And I had no cab fare. I was stuck. See, I had a reason. I see. A little different in my case. I could fly to the West Coast. But, but I appreciate your offering, Mr. Now, let's, let's talk about what everybody really wants to, uh, wants to know. The, the, the breakup with Paul, you've never really, uh, uh, I know it's awkward, and I, I God, I don't want to make you feel uncomfortable. I, I just but, don't know what to say I this mean, there, time. You know, you the, have to change your answer to keep it fresh. Yeah. I don't know what to but say. But there were, there was very early on, there were, some, there were some early problems. I think there was something with a lyric. In the beginning, Paul wanted, I wanted to call the group Garfunkel and Simon. And Paul, Paul felt it should be alphabetical. <laughs> so, so that got us off to a bad start. And then I uh, wanted to change the lyric of Mrs. Robinson just slightly from right. Jesus loves you more than you will know, whoa, yeah. whoa, whoa, yeah. to Jesus loves you more than you ever knew, woo, woo, woo. <laughs> well... They, they, they both touchy. they both work. It was a, it was a difficult it was a difficult split. I understand in in, in the world misses with you. Although you have gotten the better uh, together on uh, many occasions, and I I know it must have been difficult for you as well, Jerry, when when you when you split with with Dean. Jerry, why don't you just throw a fish and I'll go like this? <laughs> <laughs> hey! <laughs> I don't believe the check is that big. Hey, you want to know a split? I'm telling you. <laughs> Hey, do you mind if I have a lozenge? <laughs> the thing is about Dean, 
is that Dean wanted to go on his own. And I felt that that was a good thing. But they were just... <laughs> <laughs> well, I'll say that for later. Marty Allen also wanted... He had that hello no, wait, you, you, the, I, got, I was going to do that to you. I can't because we were, playing, we were talking about this and you said... As Kate Hepburn, he dated Marty Allen during the split with, 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 with Steve Rossi. And as Kate Hepburn said to Marty Allen during the split, what, 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 Kate, what was Kate's advice to Marty? Don't leave Steve Rossi. He's very good. I know, listen, I'm, I'm, we're dating. I know who you are, and I know, what, I know what you're about. But don't do it, Marty. Don't do it. He did. He regretted it. <laughs> uh, anyway, <Fine>. anyway, <laughs> I really hit you with everything. Um, yeah. You know, I just want to take a minute because we're going to go, we're going to come to a, a break, and, I, and there probably won't be a, a, a time afterwards that you two guys are both uh, already a friend of 25 years, and, and Marty, who uh, I really don't know at all, but uh, <laughs> but uh, very generously, uh, you know, agreed, even though he's making a, a Father of the Bride part two to. To come on and do all of this and uh, do all of these characters and um, and, I, and I, I'm going to take this because uh, there may not be time at the end to say to two very dear friends to come with me here tonight uh, is, is a big thing. The Jay Leno thing, you know, it's a nice gesture, but let's face it, Jay needs to get out there. It's a different ty type of thing. And let but me just you, say, Charles, yeah. uh, you know, because I know Marty, uh, Marty. And that's you. Uh, See, that's the problem. You do so many characters. Yeah, I know. Marty and Artie and... and, and and Darty, but oh, but you have never looked so fantastic. Here, here. I mean, this is a boyish-looking man. You know, when I looked up, I thought it was Ka you were looking so boyish. I thought it was Katie Lang at one time. <laughs> well, but that's the look. That's the look I'm going for. Uh, we're we're going to come up to a break here, and then we're going to come back. And Artie Garfunkel is going to sing uh, one of my favorite songs. Uh, I, I only eyes have eyes for you, and. Uh, I only have eyes for you.
a, I think a lot of people, I certainly <laughs> did, and I think almost maybe everybody here and even maybe everybody watching at some point considered the possibility. Sometimes you think maybe I'll be a basketball player, maybe I'll be this, and that. maybe everybody considers when they're very young, maybe I'll be a singer. <laughs> I mean, I know I took a shot at my daughter who's, who's over there right now. She's, she's been trying that out on me for years, you know. Uh, when did you first Were you get... thinking of being well, a singer? Well, you, know, you know, I, I upset some people. Yeah. <laughs> uh, when, when did it ever enter your mind? At what age did it occur to you? When you were five years old? At five, I would walk to school to go to kindergarten and step over the cracks in the sidewalk in rhythm and start working on You'll Never Walk Alone and all those inspirational goosebump ballads and I'd sing the whole song then start at the top in the half tone key higher just to develop my upper range. I was five. Well, why? I mean, what, what, how would you ever get that idea at five to, to do that? Did something, did you see something? Did you hear my something? My folks sang, not professionally, but around the house and they sang in two-part harmony and they did Bye Bye Blackbird and the Red Red Robin on our wire recorder. <clears throat> so I, I must have heard the pleasing sound of two-part harmony. Wow. So, so it is a lot. And now I know, I know Marty Short is sitting there saying he's going to ask Kate Hepburn if she ever <laughs> considered studying singing. And I'm not. And I don't really think that Frank ever did consider studying singing either. But Richard Burton actually did. So come back. How much time do we have? Two minutes. So, so come back to the meeting with Richard Burton because that's the one thing we didn't get to do. You met Richard Burton who was singing. I met Richard Burton in Camelot. I went backstage. I, I was so excited. I, I mapped out exactly what I was going to say to him. And he came up to me and uh, I said to him, Mr. Burton, you were absolutely brilliant tonight. You combined a brilliant voice with a brilliant singing voice. You moved me to tears. And I thought he would then say, thank you and move on to the next person. But he didn't. He started talking to me, you know, just like a person. He said, did you not find that there was a reverb in the auditorium at Oki Center? Did, like did, did, did it not bother you at all? And I said to him, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> and you moved on. <laughs> and I moved on. I just said what I thought he would say. Uh, thank you. Thank you. Uh, what do we got? We got, the, uh, we got 30 seconds. And I want to thank you again. The, the great comic artist, Martin Short, the great singing artist. I brought you a present, Chuck. Remember you said cigars are to smoke when you contemplate your good fortune. Oh, thank you. That's a quote you. from you many years I ago. I didn't remember that, but wow. if you say so, I appreciate it. Thank you very much. Congratulations on your show. Thank you very much. Thank you, everybody. And, uh, and I want to say, uh, it, uh, remind everybody that Tom Snyder debuts tonight uh, on CBS at 20 to 1. And thank you, Tom, and thank you for all your help here. And we wish you the best, although you don't need any good wishes uh, from us because... There's only one Tom Snyder, and everybody loves to watch him. Well, I do. And we're going to be taking calls uh, the rest of the week. Uh, tomorrow night, we're going to have uh, Governor Cuomo, and, uh, and we're taking calls uh, with Marla Thomas and Carol Burnett later in the week. And uh, good night, Mom. <laughs>